All right, so we are going to start the Colombia panel. Thank you all so much for, for joining us again. Um, I'm actually quite pleased to, um, to, to present to you our uh, moderator today. So Juan Caicedo, um, he's a Smith Fellow uh, at the Broad Institute uh, of MIT and Harvard. So for those who, of you who don't know the Broad, uh, you know, it's where the Genome Sequence Project uh, you know, was uh, conducted, or part of it at least. Uh, it's a powerhouse, both at MIT and Harvard, on genetic research. Uh, and, and of course, Juan is at the very center of that, so that's uh, fantastic. Uh, Juan is pioneering the use of deep learning and machine learning methods to analyze microscopy images in high-resolution genetic data. Uh, he's also expanding uh, a, on, on methods for reinforcement learning and methods for training algorithms that can um, streamline and optimize bio biological experiments, which is a great area of, of innovation today. Uh, he holds a PhD in computer, science, in computer engineering from the National University of Colombia, uh, as well as uh, different um, academic uh, trainings in, in Microsoft, Google, uh, University of Illinois, and Queen Mary University of London. So with this, uh, please help me welcome uh, Juan Caicedo. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And welcome, everybody, to the Colombia panel, the present and future of artificial intelligence in Colombia. So it's my great pleasure to moderate this session today. And uh, I want to invite the panelists that we have representing from different sectors of Colombia uh, here to the stage in order to start the discussion that we're going to have uh, about you know, what's going on in the artificial intelligence field in Colombia. So um, first, let me uh, introduce Beatriz Botero. She is a fellow at the uh, Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a doctoral candidate at Harvard Law School. Her research focuses on the governance and regulation of digital technologies deployed on cities, such as sharing economy, uh, shading economy platforms and smart city technologies. Her dissertation studies the question of data governance, data shading, and personal privacy that arise in the adoption of these technologies. She is also interested in financial regulation, financial inclusion, and fintech. Welcome, Beatrice. Our next panelist is Jaime Nino. He is a PhD in computer science, and he also has an MBA and bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the National University of Columbia. He is doing research in deep learning for financial time series modeling in low and high frequency. Jaime has 16 years of experience across multiple industries performing different activities that include software development, e-government, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, data analytics, big data, project management, business development, and strategic planning. Jaime is the lead data scientist for the Colombian Tax Authority, also known as DIAN. His team processes 4 million documents per day, mainly electronic invoices, using machine learning techniques in order to model taxpayer behavior to reduce tax evasion. Welcome, Jaime. Next, Professor Francisco Gomez. He is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at the National University of Colombia in Bogota, working in the computer science and applied mathematics programs. He is an engineer and a PhD in computer science, both from the National University of Colombia. He is currently working in artificial intelligence for computational sustainability in different regional initiatives, including improving attention of neurologically affected patients in clinical environments, the, sustainability, uh, the sustainable explanation of vegetable and animal local resources, and enhancing policy planning for citizen security. Welcome, Francisco. <clears throat> Next, Professor Germán Hernández. He is an associate professor of algorithms algorithmic trading, and machine learning at the Department of Systems and Computer Engineering at the National University of Columbia. 
he leads the research group in algorithms and combinatorics, ALGOS, and the research group in algorithmic trading, computational finance, and fintech, ALGOTRADE. Herman is also a founding partner of ALGOCODEX, an algorithmic trading company, and FACTUREX, an intelligent marketplace based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. He has a PhD in mathematics with concentration in computer science and a master's degree in computer science, both from the University of Memphis, where he has been an adjunct professor. Welcome, Herman. <laughs> and finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce Diego Hernandez. He is a PhD in economics and an industrial engineer from the National University of Colombia. He also has an MBA and a master's degree in economics from Colombian universities and a master's degree in finance from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. In 2018, he was appointed as general director of the Administrative Department of Science, Technology, and Innovation, also known as Colciencias. And on 2019, he officially became the first Minister of Science, Technology, and Innovation of Colombia until the possession of the new minister, Mabel Gisela Torres. Now, Diego has also been appointed as the first Deputy Minister of Knowledge, Innovation, and Productivity. Welcome, Diego. Great. So with this uh, great team of panelists today, uh, we're going to have a discussion about what is the present and the future of artificial intelligence in Colombia. We're going to split the panel in two parts. The first part is going to be focused on the present of artificial intelligence in Colombia. And the dynamics of this panel is going to be uh, a set of questions that we have prepared to ask uh, the representatives from different sectors uh, of artificial intelligence in Colombia to discuss what is going on uh, in the present and the future of Colombia, of artificial intelligence in Colombia. So in the first part, we're going to uh, focus on the present of artificial intelligence in Colombia. And it's going to be 20 minutes discussion and questions around that topic. So the first question for all the panelists um, is about the perception of AI in Colombia. We know that artificial intelligence has had uh, hype and a lot of attention uh, a lot of content in the web that can be found uh, to learn, apply, and even invest in artificial intelligence. And different communities have different perceptions about what is artificial intelligence. So the first question for everybody in the panel, uh, and we expect your comments to be around the area of expertise that you have, what is the perception of artificial intelligence in Colombia? Let's start with Beatriz. OK, thank you. Um, so I come from a civil society and academia, and I think, and I've been in the US for a few years now, so I've actually, I haven't participated as directly in Colombia as I wish, but I think um, Colombian academics and uh, civil society members are pretty much on top of the discussions that we have in our area about what AI means, and what we focus on is mostly on the risks and ethical implications, and. Um, and how maybe data governance needs to be updated or not. I think there's a pretty good network of people working on these issues, and they've been start, uh, trying to start study, doing like pilots uh, in seeing how AI is mostly implemented in government, in the constitutional court, and uh, the general attorney's office. But I think we, are, we still need to start creating local frameworks that uh, really speak to like Colombia's needs and, and are eventually translated into maybe impact litigation or legal reform or so on. So I think we're still at a stage in which, and I think this is generally true also for the national strategy. We have a national governmental strategy about AI, but that strategy still mostly echoes what uh, the discussion is in Europe and following many of the OECD directives. But I think we, we still need to develop like our own local frameworks, local regulations, local, I don't know, interoperability standards, uh, local safety nets. Um, I think that's what we're at, but I think, I think it's, a, it's a very, very good network of people, and I'm sure that work is coming. 
Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you to Omar for the for this summit and the, all of the people here. Um, well, I think um, my perspective is that uh, in general, uh, Colombia is, is is doing or is taking very good, very good steps in order to to get involved in this. Uh, we have a, a national policy now that is called Compass. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's a big framework for what to do in, in AI. And uh, particularly myself, I have like, the privilege to be in, in a very challenging project for the country that is electronic invoice. Mm -hmm. So basically, any transaction that happens uh, is reported real time in real time to the tax authority. And, and this project has a, a great impact uh, for all the country, but as well for the tax authority because uh, we are very aware of the uh, need to process and analyze a huge quantities of data using modern techniques. So it's not only machine learning or artificial intelligence, but it is all go, uh, always uh, as well big data, cloud computing, and a lot of stuff uh, that is uh, in the fourth revolution that we are leading in the administration, in the tax authority. So uh, I will say that uh, from my point of view and in my sector, uh, we are very aware of the need for a good implementation of this kind of technologies and uh, how the result will be in getting more money to fund social uh, projects across the country. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, the short answer is, is, is a good perception, but let me uh, talk about uh, a small example we have. Uh, we have a project in like 2016, I was working with the major office uh, trying to analyze data about fear, of, uh, fear to the crime. Okay, then uh, after finishing the project, I just published like, two papers and I think, okay, I, I need to get some money for these ideas. Maybe there is something interesting and worthy to uh, go here. Then uh, I decided as academic, starting to write a, a, a grant. Uh, you, that, 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 that's the, that's the, common, uh, the, the common practice. And um, when I started to write the grant, obviously I, don't, I am not an expert in legal issues and in uh, these uh, health public issues. Then I started to look in my university, which is the largest university in Colombia, and I realized that there, there was no anyone uh, with the language uh, and uh, open to talk about these kind of things. Then that's the first reflection, that's, uh, that's the first um, message in Colombia, the academic uh, are not prepared to deal with these kind of problems. I'm not talking about the technical part, I'm talking about discussing uh, things which are interdisciplinary. Okay, then uh, I started, I finally I found some nice uh, partners, obviously the government. Uh, the government has a lot of pressure uh, of the public opinion. Then the government is open to work on this kind of project, and this is good. You can go with the government in Colombia, and if you have a, a nice idea, uh, you can push it. In the middle of the process, uh, we, we, we were really lucky to start to work with a private company, Quantil, uh, an applied mathematics company, and uh, after having contact with them, uh, we realized that there is a, a, a small but really active community, uh, a, a, a set of people that is really pushing these ideas, or they are really trying to do serious things. Finally, we get the money, three years after we, uh, we asked for the money, uh, and uh, there, was, there were some news, some interviews, and some news in local uh, journals, and uh, that brings me to the, to, the, to the last point, the global perception of this kind of technology. The, the news was, uh, we are going to invest some money to try to predict crime. Basically, that was the, 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 the idea of the project, and, and this is just circumstantial evidence. When I started to talk with the people about this article, they say, okay, this is not science fiction. The people is using this kind of technology every day. You have this kind of technology for, I don't know, weather prediction. And, and, and this is good. As soon as they have this kind of artifacts that works are more or less, more or less well, they don't worry about uh, if we are using the data. Obviously, we should be responsible about that. But just to summarize, I think that Colombia is one of these examples in which you can, if you have a nice idea, 
and you have nice contacts, good contacts, you can realize that you can build real solution around this kind of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you to the group for organizing this discussion and for us in contact with all the Latin American community. My perception, I've been in, in the academics like for 25 years, I've I seen a switch in the perception in Colombia and an openness from the society and from like sectors that I was, years ago, they were like totally apathetic to the use of new technologies. Uh, I've seen it from young people because I am involved like in financial things. There are new people trying to innovate with providing services with pe to people that are like not included in the economical cycle. Then I seen like a hundred startups that are trying to use machine learning to do credit prediction and go with like mothers that are like single heads of family and they cannot access loans because they, they don't have a credit history. And I seen all this energy there. But in the past two years, I also saw a sector that was like very conservative, totally open to use these technologies. And it was the legal system. The legal system is totally crumbled because they are similar to the US in a total crisis. We just came out of a peace process. They started a new parallel system of, of justice. And the previous justice system is extremely slow. In a case that in our university, we're working, helping the school of law with one case. It was a case that happens like 25 years ago. It took like 10 years in the, in the legal cycle. And at the end, they have the decision to compensate some people that have some problem. And the process was like a small office, seven people trying to solve a problem for like half a million people that were claiming like that they have a right to have a compensation. And they tried with that and when they realize it's impossible, then they say, use whatever you want. And now we're trying to use machine learning to produce legal sort of like administrative legal uh, decisions to compensate people on those things. But for my surprise and through the contacts established in Latin, in Latin America, we realized the, the constitutional court in Colombia that has the responsibility of closing cases that are related to fundamental rights. And it was because in the 91 constitutional reform, they established a like a legal system that allow people to go to any judge and ask to be protected because one of his fundamental rights, or one of his or her fundamental rights are being violated. Uh, the judge has to decide like in 72 hours if he awards like a warranty. And that system is working, it's called tutela in Colombia. And we have 2,700 approximately uh, like decisions every day. And this court has to take every year out of like close to a million, 700,000 decisions, and pick cases that they're gonna review and close. And my surprise was like, I knew that was a complicated process. It's been like, the, the tutela is, is almost impossible because of the numbers. They were working with the lab, the, the artificial intelligence lab of the University of Buenos Aires, doing machine learning, learning from the cases that were relevant that they like, we're classifying before, and they are about to launch a real selection process for these fundamental rights decisions. They pick and close exactly like the Supreme Court in the United States. They pick cases, and they close those things. Then I seen a perception in the society, the openness of like cities like Bogota with 10 million people, that they say, we're going to use all the information to try to reduce crime in the city. And nobody's complaining. They're going to use cameras that are mounted in patrol vehicles, they are used three or 4,000 cameras around the city. They're gonna use all the information that they have from like private and public partners. And they say the university plus the city plus a company that does apply mathematics are working on trying to reduce and make the city more safe for our kids, for our elders, and nobody's complaining. Then I seen like a switch, it was like something that they were doubtful and they were very worried about rights, and now it's like, if that thing works, let's use it. And then coming from the lawyers that usually are extremely conservative and having automatic things, making legal decisions and being done, for me it was like, now is in the reality. Now even like sectors that were like totally apathetic are in this wave, doing real things with technology. 
Uh, thank you for the invitation in, to this panel. And let me uh, explain three kinds of, of view. First, as academic, because I came from the Universidad Nacional, and I, I believed in the, in the academic, the perspective and the knowledge and the initiatives in the artificial intelligence is very good. For example, during the last five years, the numbers of the group research groups has increased a lot, uh, more, than, more than 80% of the groups, mainly in artificial intelligence. In this moment, we have 80 groups approximately in, in, in Colombia. It's a very good no number, mm -hmm. but also we have a, a research groups in computing methodologies, a, distributed uh, computing methodologies, com computer graphics, computer graphics, modeling and simulation, machine learning, uh, parallel computing methodologies, and symbolic and algebraic kit manipulation. That, that is a very good uh, symptoms of the, how is the academy uh, view the, the, this opportunity of the technology. But if you go to the private sector, for example, the national uh, national office of the planet of the planning, planning uh, did uh, uh, surveys about how is the the uh, companies or entrepreneurs uh, thinking about the the technologies, uh, computing or artificial intelligence. And it's very dramatic, the, the results. It's, it's very dramatic. The most of them don't use, for example, cloud computing. Is the, uh, no more than 10% is using. Uh, digital fields, for example, only 10%. Uh, software for, uh, for uh, um, gestion or for management is very low also. Uh, data analytics is very poor, big data and uh, artificial intelligence is very, very low. The, the public sector is using uh, digital uh, uh, technologies, but the private sector no. For that reason, it's, it's very, very big the gap between private sector and public sector in Colombia. For that reason, the actual government that uh, our president is very young, uh, and he knows the importance of the technology. He established since last year the, four, the center for the fourth revolution industrial in Medellin. It's very good, uh, that's, the, uh, that's idea, because in that, in that center uh, is to create capacities and promote uh, that uh, technology. I, I believe it's a very good step. The second step of the government is like common uh, Jaime, is the compass, is the policies for uh, di transformation, digital transformation and artificial intelligence that establish which is the, the way, mainly to, crea to create capacities, okay? And one of, the, of those capacities that we are needing in this moment is the human capital. For that reason, uh, ma, uh, the Minister of the Science and Technology last year uh, uh, created an, a new compass in order to establish a high level of the education, mainly in STEM abilities or skills. And the idea is to uh, choose any of that fellowships for artificial intelligence. And that's, I believe it, this is very, uh, very, wet, uh, very good way to establish very good capacities in human resource. The other, the other gap is the infrastructure, but I believe the, the, is, is the, it depends on the resources in the future. The future. Great. <coughs> uh, very interesting. Uh, basically, what uh, you have described so far is uh, a lot of openness uh, to you know, adopt the technology and also interest from the different sectors of society. Um, and uh, the next question is uh, a little bit more focused on the academic part. So this is for uh, Francisco and Herman. Uh, can you very briefly describe uh, what is the dynamics uh, in the universities 
uh, for the adoption and, you know, um, uh, yeah, mainly the adoption of artificial intelligence classes, projects, courses, research groups uh, in Colombian universities. So, Herman, please. Like some 15 years ago, there was a high interest in the use of AI, machine learning in uh, medical areas. Uh, Juan is one of our, uh, Juan and Francisco here, were involved like in using machine learning in images, image processing, actually from real problems in Colombia because it's a very wide dispersed country with like some populations that are highly isolated. And at some point we thought these technologies uh, will allow to provide medical services in remote isolated populations. Uh, Francisco started working like in a group that was using a remote uh, microscope to try to allow pathologies from like the cities to check tissues and do diagnosis because it was impossible to take a pathologist to do a diagnosis in the middle of the jungle. At some point they have in the capital of our Amazon state that is called Amazons, like a, a, a remote uh, microscope that was connected to a satellite connection and a pathologist was able to navigate in a tissue and do a diagnosis. Then, for some reason, some of them, they kind of move and went to the leading groups around the world that are working on that. We lost most of them. Then, in recent years, I've seen more attention, like, to groups and staying there, like, locally in, in local programs. The, I have the perception, and talking to Francisco recently, that we kind of lost that, that big bunch of people in solving problems in Colombia. Somehow we prepared you guys. You guys were very successful, and but you end up in the top-notch places around the world, Europe, Australia, the United States. And we then capitalize all your skills to solve important problems in Colombia. We are trying now to convince the new generation to, hey, prepare, but be conscious. And even if you go abroad, keep the connections and keep in touch with the local problems and try to change our reality a little bit. OK, let me share something with you that there is, maybe it's fake news, but coronavirus, you know, coronavirus. Uh, we are working uh, in something which is a, 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 a animal epidemiology uh, with the sanitary authority there in Colombia. Uh, but it seems like uh, there are some risk of introducing these things to, to, to Colombia. This, this is the kind of things artificial intelligence can help. Uh, and this, this is just a comment because I, I just saw the, 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 the WhatsApp. And, 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 and this is the kind of things we should be prepared to solve in short times. We cannot wait two years or three years to face this problem. And, and, and close this, this parenthesis. Uh, I want to take the point of, of, of Professor Herman. Um, uh, we are, with Juan, we are the result of a 15 years investment, serious investment in uh, education. They put money to train people locally in Colombia. And that was a good idea because, because in that moment there was a lot of, a lot now, but a small group of passionate professors. They take the leading in that moment, they train it as uh, really smart and good people, and uh, as a result of this investment of time, there was a, a, a generation of people that, uh, I don't agree with you, but some of them, not most, but some of them, they come back to the regions, and they are doing really serious and nice things. You will see in the future that these guys will be the leader in their fields. They are, they are doing uh, precision agriculture, they are doing uh, AI in education, they are doing so many things in the regions. Are, are, are they can be here, but they decided to come back to Colombia. And, 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 and this is just some provocative message. If you want a challenge, because you are here because you, are, you, you, you like challenge, just come back to your regions and try to start something. That, that's really hard. That's, that's, that's difficult, that's, 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 a, that's a real challenge. Start an institute, start something there, but being there, we cannot lose the money from where is going to come the next uh, great uh, discovery. It's going to come from, from here, because here 
You have the density of bright people. And we are just investing in, from Colombia and from Latin America in general, putting people here. It, and this is good because you are well trained. But we can make it also in Latin America. Just think on uh, Artur Avila from IMPA Institute. He just won the Nobel Prize in Mathematics in 2016. But 70 years was the investment in time, a lot of effort, uh, state policies. Uh, we should try to replicate this in Latin America. I don't know how, but I'm sure that the, the way to solve problems in Latin America is solving solve with you, smart people, but there. Great. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, you're also talking about, you know, like the, the policies for uh, keeping people around. Uh, and I would like to uh, ask the panel as well, like what are the uh, laws or, or governmental decisions that, you know, have been happening in Colombia with respect to artificial intelligence uh, and, and, and the needs for um, regulation in this type of field? And more specifically, the question is for Diego. Uh, is the government discussing laws for regulating artificial intelligence in Colombia? You mentioned the COMPES. Yes. You can give us a little bit more details about that. Yes. The COMPES is for policy, the for policies. Um, the new Minister of the Science and Technology and Innovation, uh, one of the goals of the homework is to establish the regulation policy. It's the, is the very important topic. And we know that we need to create the regulation for artificial intelligence, uh, but it's not only uh, the Minister of the Science, it's also with the Minister of the Ethics that uh, we need to, to work together in order to establish the regulation policy uh, for the, these kinds of technologies. Uh, this is the, the big challenge for, for this government. And I believe that it's necessary to, to start this, uh, this step. Yes. Great. Mm. Um, and uh, also, um, artificial intelligence uh, involves not just uh, you know, the uh, infrastructure and, um, and the solutions themselves, but also data. And uh, most of the artificial intelligence algorithms today require access to large amounts of data and more specifically personal data. So uh, this question is for Beatriz. Uh, mm -hmm. Colombia has laws in place for personal data protection. And is this policy an AI friendly policy? Uh, do you know how it compares to other regulations around the world? What's your perspective? Um, yeah, thank you. Also, thank you for inviting me. I forgot to thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is a conversation that is going on everywhere in the world, and I don't think Colombia's regulation is particularly behind, maybe. A an important pre-question to your question is maybe, what do we mean by AI-friendly data regulation policy? I would, try to con I, would, I would like to try to make the argument in this audience that actually the AI ecosystem and the AI community should be worried about personal data and should, should really consider that a, even though some privacy regulations might seem like they hold back the technology development at first sight, a, it actually really impacts the legitimacy of many of the AI implementations. And so this is a very, I, I, think, I think it is very important for entrepreneurs and people in government and academia developing these the solutions to be worried about what are uh, fair and, and safe ways to, to, to gather, collect, and, and use personal data. And, and back to Colombia, Colombia has an AVEAS data regulation, that's the way we call it, and it's about it's maybe about a seven years old, like its latest update. And I think it's, it's still very similar to what we have in the US and in Europe, in that it relies on, per, on, on individual consent as the main enabler to allow a, a company or, or, a, or a government to collect data and analyze it. I, I think we're all familiar with it. Like when, you're, when you access a, any service online, you accept the terms, the terms of, of agreement, and that sort of gives um, the collector the right to use your data, analyze it, collect it, often to sell it a, or trade it. That's not allowed in Colombia. I think the discussion everywhere in the world is that we need to give users more control over their data. 
So California just passed a law in which users are able to opt out of their data being sold. Uh, the GDPR in Europe uh, has something that the Colombia law actually already had, which is that people are allowed to ask companies or, or the government to delete data that is no longer used of them. Um, but I think where, where the conversation is leaning towards is that that is actually not enough. Um, in that we are we are burdening individuals with the with the, the mammothal task of self managing their information, and that's very hard uh, for anyone, even for people like us who understand uh, sort of what's going on. It's very hard for us to keep track of our data and measure in advance whether something might harm us or not in the future. And I think the conversation everywhere in the world, and that, that, that might be particularly important in, in Colombia, but also other countries in Latin America, with very high levels of inequality, uh, people who sadly don't have access to a lot of education might not really understand what's going on. We need to really start thinking the trade-offs of what are uses, uses of our data that we find legitimate, that are dangerous, that we maybe should forbid. I think something that we're seeing, and I think this is actually to the previous question, where civil society needs to get it, get their act together in Colombia a little bit more. I think it's actually bewildering that uh, Herman was just telling us that civil society has not really reacted to the bunch of surveillance uh, technology that is, that is being installed in Colombian cities. I think it's it's uh, it sort of threatens values that we have about due process of law and. Uh, anonymity and self-determination that our information can be used uh, with very little constraints. But I think, I think that's, that's a conversation in which Colombia is not particularly behind, uh, mainly because it's a conversation that the world is having. I think we just need to jump in. And then maybe just to, to follow up like very quickly, Colombia does have another compass, which are this like general frameworks about where national policy should be heading. Uh, on big data, and I think, um, and I think the idea of the compass is to sort of uh, use the, inf the the infrastructure of government to open up data sets that the government has and gathers for its various uh, forms, its various functions, to open it up in safe ways. But I think it hasn't been regulated, so there are no really uh, standards of interoperability. There are no really standards of anonymization. Um, I think I think this is some. There, there are really standards about how the the, the private sector and the public sector should share data, share data safely, uh, which is something that's very important. Like the the private sector can really benefit from government's uh, information and vice versa. But we need to like figure out uh, how that how how that should happen. That's another conversation that is happening in the world. But I think it needs to happen in Colombia too. Um, yeah. Great. So. Um from strategies to keep the talent around uh, to you know uh, policies that are being developed uh, and also uh, the privacy of data. Uh, another question regarding the current state of artificial intelligence in Colombia is how much the private sector or uh, in general how much investment is being done in uh, artificial intelligence currently in Colombia. And this question is uh, for uh, Jaime. So uh, do you know of any um, initiative to invest in artificial intelligence in Colombia, either from the private sector or, uh, you know, from any other entities? Yes. Uh, fortunately, I think that uh, because of the, the, the line that the government has done, uh, actually we, we have become a hub in artificial intelligence, uh, and there are many actors interested. So, for example, from the, from the government side, we have a, a fund that is called Impulsa, that is promoting uh, entrepreneurs to, to build companies, uh, to, to get funds to, to uh, develop the social ideas. And on the other side, we have a lot of private funds that, uh, as a venture capitalist, are going to Colombia to inject capital to early stage companies in order to develop uh, things in machine learning, blockchain, uh, IoT. Uh, and just to name one, one person, Andrew Ng, decided to, to create one, or to, to put one of the headquarters of uh, London AI and Deep Learning AI, AI in Colombia, and in particular in Medellin. And that's, that, that speaks very, very well of uh, what the Colombian government or the Colombian as a state 
is doing in order to promote talented people uh, with uh, some uh, investment from overseas and as well to promote the ecosystem of uh, venture capitalists within the country. So, of course, we need a lot of, a lot of work uh, because uh, we need to, to, to improve the collaboration staff between, across the, co the country, across uh, companies, across entities, across persons. But I think there are a, a good initiatives that are pushing up uh, the country to move forward in this. Great. Juan, uh, let me complement the, the yes, participation. Please. We have uh, uh, other instruments. Uh, Jaime comment about the Impulsa. But uh, we, uh, since our minister, uh, we uh, promote the projects uh, in technology. And when the private company uh, doing the project in technology, for example, in artificial intelligence, they can present uh, the project to the national board of the benefits uh, the taxes. Yes. And uh, if the project, uh, uh, if the company apply uh, with the project, uh, we uh, we can reduce the the taxes. The taxes. The the, the board uh, is participate uh, the Ladian, uh, Minister of Commerce, uh, Minister of the Science and Technology, and then um, National Planning Office, mm. plan, plan Office, and we uh, study the the project, and if applied to the technology, we reduce the the, the taxes. Uh, the tax is very important because it's the twenty five percent of the total uh, project can apply to, the, to reduce the, the, the taxation. The ta the taxation. That's right. it, that is very important. Okay. The second uh, instrument that was implemented uh, la since last year was, was the, uh, the enrollment of the PhD uh, person. If the PhD person uh, enrolled in the private sector, the, f the 50% uh, Twenty-five percent of the salary can reduce the taxes, also. But if the company doesn't have the uh, liquid rent to pay uh, taxes, they can use the fifty percent of the salary to pay other taxes. This is very, very good instrument. We are proving uh, this uh, new instrument. But the idea is to promote the science and technology uh, innovations. Uh, with this kind of technology in the private sector in order to increase the motivation and the, and the participation. Excellent. Yes, it's a very, very good instrument. Great. Mm. Uh, and uh, I also have one last question for Diego. Uh, he, in order to, cla you know, to close this first part uh, of the panel about the presence of AI in Colombia, and it, it goes uh, back to the academic situation of uh, uh, of AI in Colombia and the academic productivity. Mm -hmm. uh, Colombia has um, a very large system to keep track of academic productivity in different areas of science. And uh, I wonder like, what is the productivity in terms of AI research in Colombia, yes. in terms of uh, papers or any other academic products that Colombia delivers? Yes. Uh Colombia, uh, during the last 20 year, 25 years, uh, has uh, increased the capacities of the academic for research. Uh, like comment uh, at, the, at the start of this panel, uh, we had uh, in this moment 80, 80 uh, research, group. research groups in, in artificial intelligence. But in the total group in research uh, in Colombia, it are more than 5,000 groups, uh, and 30% uh, of them is very good level of the, of, the, of the status, and the numbers of the publications per year are more than 12,000 per year, per year. The problem with the uh, publications is, in this moment, is to, to high quality, because we had not uh, reached the one, the citation one, uh, according with the rest of the, of, the, of the countries. And the idea is to, to at least to reach that percentage. Uh, also, uh, increase the, the excellence, the finance, finance, financial, financial financiation, 
financial uh, support to the researchers. And the idea is to this, but it's very low citations uh, index. Uh, but the number of the, of, the, of the publications has increased also. We had a, close to 100 uh, uh, journals, a very good level ar around, the, around the world. In total, in Colombia, very good uh, journals, 200 and half. But the, uh, in the top are close to 100. That is very important because it's very good reference are, uh, mainly in respect to America, uh, Latin America. And I believe there's other, other issue that we had uh, or other challenges that we have to, to improve during the uh, operation of the new minister. Great. Uh, so we're going to switch gears and talk about the future of AI in Colombia. And this question goes to all the panelists. Uh, AI as a technology can be produced or can be adopted. And adoption means consuming solutions created by other countries, while production means having the talent to create AI solutions uh, for uh, solving local problems or for helping others solve the problems. So what can Colombia do to become an AI superpower in order to generate services for other countries and solve their own problems that, that we have in the country? So Diego, please. I believe the, the first one is mobility. We had a lot of problems in mobility uh, in Colombia, mainly in the, in the capitals, for example, Bogotá, Cali, Medellín, Barranquilla. Uh, the, the congestion is each day uh, bad. And I believe the uh, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence can help to solve this, this problem because it's very, very big problem. It's the, the first problem. The second one is the healthy, uh, the inequality in Colombia in, in education and in healthy is, is very poor. And I believe uh, the artificial intelligence can solve the problem. For example, in education, the access to the education. I believe it's the best way to, to reduce the inequality uh, in the education. Uh, however, it's necessary to uh, create the capacities, the connections to the mainly to the rural areas, because the, in, in, the, in the urban areas, we have very good uh, connection. But you go to the rural area, it's very, very low the, the connection. Uh, Last year, the Minister of the Technologies and Information Communication uh, promoted the, the law in order to uh, reach the connection for all countries, uh, to move the, from 4 million of the families to 11, uh, close to 12 million of the family. Mainly, the, this, this new target is located in the rural area. Uh, I believe if we reach that goal, that is the idea during these three years, uh, that the rest to this government uh, will be possible uh, to uh, reach uh, to that area, better education, uh, better uh, health system, and also uh, improve the inequality in Colombia in the rural area. Is the three, the three goals. Uh, the possibility with the artificial intelligence that uh, reduce the inequality in Colombia. Excellent. Mm. I, I will say things like this, like reconnecting and connecting with the Latin American community. We've been qualifying people and reconnect with the people that, quali that we qualify and they are abroad in very competitive institutions to rekindle their attention in our problems and they don't have to leave MIT or they don't have to come back from uh, Europe all. But these, these, these actions that seem like kind of random, I think will reconnect us. And because it's difficult to be on top without being connected with the leading two nations that are in this revolution, like China and the US. Then I think this, this action will produce the collaborations on uh, local groups connecting them with local needs. The effort that the government is doing in improving the connections to internet to rural areas, 
that is being done since 2013 that they established the Minister of Telecommunications and uh, Technologies of Information, plus the actions to try to strengthen the research and academic environment. I, I think those things are crystallizing and also the capacity to attract investors, high level investors like Andrew NG that is not only putting money in Colombia, but is bringing people from Egypt, from Europe, to work in Colombia in new, he's, he's convinced that he has to work in other problems like agriculture, like things that are not the common things that we're doing, like human rights, like other industries that are not the common things and we will have like strong successes with artificial intelligence and machine learning. I think that's, that, that could be the possibility, but it will be better than not only Colombia, like if Latin America could Capitalize it, be one of the leading producer of like interesting solutions for Latin America and for the world as a as a whole system, like with enormous economies like Argentina and Chile and Brazil, plus all the needs like in the other countries where the inequalities are even bigger and the technologies are like committees are far behind in technology like in Central America. We should be worried like probably to try to have the guys that are here and around the leading places in the world collaborating with the guys in Colombia and connecting you with needs. That will be the possibility and I think that's one of the goals of this important effort that you guys did to organize this thing. Okay, do you know who is Darwin? Darwin. <laughs> Darwin is famous because he came to America and he think he explored South America, he found something. He realized as a scientist that something is there, something is happening there. That's the way. There, there is no other way. You should live there. You should experience all the problems we have. Otherwise, you cannot solve the things from far. I mean, it, it, when, when you have uh, the protest, the social protest in front of your house, you, you, you think, okay, I, I should do something to solve that problem. Then, I think that's the way, it's simple. If we manage to attract people, obviously. If our Colombian guys, I, I will really happy. But if the people came from Cambridge, Oxford, wherever they came, if, as soon as they are good people, I will be happy. Because I may learn, my students can learn, and we can build something. But the people should stay there. They should live there. You cannot ask me to solve the problem of predictive security here because I don't live here. I don't know how things work. I don't know what are the problems. I don't know what is the impact of the things I, I am doing here. There, I feel comfortable because I, I am Colombian. I'm a Colombian guy. I know how things work. I know how to do things. And I, I think places like Colombia in general, Latin America are, are open places. Uh, time to time, we see people from really nice universities I, uh, like this trying to, 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 to gain a space in Latin America, and, and unfortunately, we, we close that, that spaces. Uh, we should be open. If we want to grow, we should manage how to attract people and convince people that Latin America is a nice place to live, and to research, and to do science, and to grow a family if they want. Uh, well, I think that uh, we, have, we have, at this point in time, very good foundations, like we have a, a policy or goals from to to to, for, uh, to give education to people in these areas. I mean, the, the government has a plan to to skill 250,000 people in uh, artificial intelligence and uh, all of all the uh, for for revolution technologies. We have as well uh, some uh, the the IT sector in Colombia is quite strong, I mean the companies in the private sector, but they mostly uh, are doing business, or, or we are kind of becoming the, the, the India of South America. I mean, there is a lot of companies that make business outside and, and because of the cheap labor, we do it inside Colombia. Uh, we have the government that is, is pushing with regulation, with, uh, with uh, tax uh, facilitation for, for new companies, incentives. incentives. Uh, as well, within the government, there are big projects that are using this technology, but we need to collaborate more. I mean, uh, our society is, is very like separated, alone, academia on this side, 
government on the side, private sector on the side. So we need to strengthen and, and to open, to, to be open to collaboration. Uh, we need to, to repeat or to mimic the, the Ruta N, it's called in Medellin, the, the program. The, it's like in way in, in English probably. It's a, it's, it's a whole community of people working around this. So we need to do that in Barranquilla, in Cali, Bogota, in, in many places. And, and, and one challenges, we are plenty of challenges. So I think we need to, to keep pushing the, the moment. Um, yeah, I think something that's very important for policymakers in particular to keep in mind is that many of the things that will enable Colombia, but also most likely any Latin American country to develop a fructiferous AI ecosystem has actually very little to do with AI. And uh, so in the previous panel, there was someone speaking about too long commutes and, and we've spoken before about um, inequality and how some people don't have access to the internet or they don't have access to a bunch of social infrastructures. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I think those other things uh, and sort of other more traditional, perhaps less sexy strategies to address social challenges are, are going to be very important to determine how Latin America uh, ends up being a player in the fourth industrial revolution. So if we, if we go on being um, the most unequal region in the world and Colombia is like the second most unequal country in the, in the region, so that's pretty bad. Uh, we have, I don't know, half of the country lives pretty similar to how I live here in the US. The other half of the country lives pretty much the same as they've been living for the past 200 years. I think those patterns of inequality really make it difficult for us to uh, take advantage of, of a bunch of talent that most likely exists out there. It makes it very hard for investors and other people to want to go to Colombia and be there. Uh, I think I think it's it's also I'll speak more about this later, but but I think thinking about how we create a social infrastructure that is not only AI based but analog based, how we give people good roads and good healthcare and good education, those will be enablers for for Colombia and the rest of Latin America to to become players that can actually compete and 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 reap the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution, and that's. That's maybe not like the sexiest of the solutions, like to say, oh, we need kindergartens and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I think that's, that's actually, uh, once, once we have those things and, and if we focus on those, then maybe more kids will go to college and more investors and more people like me will want to go back to Colombia. Uh, and, and I think those things, just to, just to add to what the rest of the panel said, I think those are very important things to keep in mind and we shouldn't like, let ourselves be blinded by how cool AI or other stuff can be. Great. Uh, uh, we have several more questions, but I'm gonna close with just the final question and I'm gonna leave it open to whoever wants to answer. Uh, there are many eth ethical implications of using AI, uh, especially in a post-conflict country such as Colombia. Uh, in which you know AI can be used for tracking uh, people and so on and so forth. What are oh, what considerations and what limits should be considered to ensure that AI is not used unfairly against uh, their own citizens? Can I go? Yeah, please. Right. So I think actually Logic. this is something where Logic. Latin America should pride itself. We have very good constitutions. This is true for Colombia, but it's very similar to the Brazilian one. It's very similar to the Peruvian one. And we have fairly nice lists of fundamental rights and so on. That's something that the US doesn't have, for example, so the discussion is way harder here. And I think we need to start understanding how those legal frameworks that we've developed for the past, I don't know, 30 years, uh, apply to the development of this constitution. So we have a right to non-discrimination, we have a right to community participation, we have rights to privacy. Uh, I think we start to need developing those frameworks and then we also need to like start building up on uh, documents and ideas that have been developed by, by research centers and international organizations in the US and Europe in the past, actually like one or two years. So it's not like we're super far behind. This is something that is happening in the world right now. Um, 
The OECD has a set of ethical principles that were published like a year ago and the Bergman Client Center here uh, across the, not across the, like up Mass app, just published an AI principle uh, document. And I think there are fairly, fairly straightforward guidelines about how to go about this. It's very important to keep communities engaged at the moment of building data sets and designing and implementing algorithms. It's very important to keep the usual suspects in mind. How is an AI system affecting uh, women, affecting people of colors, uh, indigenous communities? Um, it's very important to, to think whether the social cost of applying a particular AI system may, create, may, may have a, a, an effect that is socially costly and we shouldn't go about it because a lot of the discussion on AI bias assumes that there is a problem in the data set or a problem in the algorithm that we are biased and so we are, for example, passing our bias to the algorithm. But sometimes the algorithm is correct and still might, might lead to a harmful result. What if a credit score is harming a young woman from favelas or stuff like that? It is actually maybe true that they are less likely to pay the credit on time because of a variety of structural reasons. But if we still apply their algorithm, they're gonna get maybe less credit, they're gonna get less chances, and we might, we might need to make the social choice not to implement that technology or not in that way or create other mechanisms. So I think sort of keeping in mind that there are a bunch of trade-offs at all levels of designing these technologies and uh, making, keeping humans on the loop is very important, making sure that most decisions are subject to human review, that they are explainable, that there's transparency about how these technologies are used. Um, those are all things that are out there ready for all the policymakers in the room um, to take home and, and apply. Uh, but I actually think that the legal frameworks in Colombia are, are very, very suitable to apply those. I don't think it's, it doesn't need to be rocket science. It's, it's harder to develop the algorithms than do this part. It's just a problem of political will, which I hope we'll have. Can I? Can, can I? Sorry. No, I, I just want to, to, okay. Yeah, sorry. I think I'm we're sorry, I took time. all the time. <laughs> I won't, I won't so speak much, more. Uh, to all the panel for okay. all the interesting discussions. I hope this keeps going after the panel. Thank you so much to the organizers, Omar Costilla, and thank you everybody thank you. for being here today. Okay, thank you. Thank you.